I think about this picture of the Timberline as a place where life meets death where you're reminded of where you've come from and you're reminded of where you've come to in Christ and what you have in Christ, but you're also challenged to not stay in a place of life, but to go and engage a dying world. At Timberline, it's been awesome to see that happen, both in students' lives. I think of the death that many of our students and guests' churches have experienced. And even within the church, they find themselves in places of death and need the life of Christ within the body of Christ itself, within the church. And then of course, there's the environment that we live in, this kind of outdoor extreme environment, ski area, uh, a community who are up there thinking they're gonna find life in the mountains and find themselves uh, just as empty with beauty all around them. Go across the state, go all over the Rocky Mountains, or really all over the world, alpine portions of the world, you find the Timberline. It's such a significant geographic line of, of demarcation. It's significant, it's dramatic, it's radical. The life below Timberline is different than the life above Timberline. That Timberline, I mean, it's what it says. That's where the that's where the the trees stop, and you get up there into the wind, and you get up there into the you know into the higher elevations. Above that timberline, there are these storms that roll in super fast, and you don't want to be caught up there. But there is that ascent to the summit, and when you get up there, you look around. And it's like this was worth it. The Timberline is a line that really separates life and death in a lot of ways. You've got this area where trees can no longer grow because it's either too cold or the, the environment's too hostile for them to take root and grow. And, and in some ways it's a beautiful area, in other ways it's, it's an incredibly dangerous and hostile place to go. As I think about Timberline, one of the beautiful things that we see is we invite people in to grow, to, to understand and know the life of Christ. And, and it's so awesome to see people find it, to find Christ, to understand Him. But then we don't want to stay in the comfort of that place. We, we want, as I think Christ longed for, and as Christ told His disciples, to not stay in the comfort of, of the life they'd found, but to go out into the world, really to go to Timberline, back to that hostile environment of the world to share the hope and the life that was found in Christ. And, and I see that in a lot of ways to be the history of Timberline over the last 25 years. Through the witness of, of my sister, who very clearly, simply, relentlessly uh, shared the gospel with me. When I came to the end of myself, I was able to lead myself in the sinner's prayer. And I knew the moment I did, I can still see myself knelt down doing that, that I, I knew that I had crossed a threshold from death, eternal death, to eternal life. And then I went forward from there as a new Christian, began to grow, trying to figure out how to get into God's Word and what His will for my, my life was, which is what led me to Tauernhof to go to Upward Bound initially and then fall Bible school as a student. While I was at Tauernhof those first six months, I really clarified and confirmed what Jesus had saved me from. My old life, my life apart from Christ, and 
As I did that, I gained freedom from my past, but then through the teaching I was receiving, I discovered and began to experience what Jesus had saved me for. New life, true life, life to the full, Christ's life in me. I had seen pictures of Austria from a principal who had showed pictures of Europe to the school, and that was just in my mind. And so that was one of the things that God used to take me to Tarnhof. And I had learned there for the first time that Jesus Christ not only had saved me, and I had a home in heaven, but he'd come that I might have life abundantly. I had never understood that before. I didn't know that the resurrection power that raised Christ from the dead lived in me, and that it that was that power that I could live the rest of my life from. And really, <clears throat> through that, he allowed me to be the teacher that I was, the coworker, the later, the mom, the wife, the friend everything grandmother yeah now grandma <laughs> that i am and that he was making me into be and um i can honestly say throughout all of life and it's now 64 years and i can look back and say for the 40 some years as a believer he has sustained me he has walked with me for everything he's left never left me or forsaken me i often thought, oh, how cool would it be to be a ski instructor someday, you know, in Colorado, Winter Park, or wherever, someplace, and had an opportunity to instruct as part of the winter program at Taranoff and help with Bible schools, dean of students. Even though I had finished school, been in business, had, had a lot of responsibility in the different things I'd done, I found this role at Taranoff was really overwhelming. But it was just a great catalyst for growth, spiritual growth, practicing dependency on the Lord. Bible school was that threshold where we experienced Jesus in a life-changing way. It gave us the purpose that everything that we would do within our home, within our community, that we would live intentionally for Jesus. A big burden on our hearts was to have a place where people could have that threshold life experience to really discover what it means to live with Jesus. We left with a seed, desire, or vision what if someday, you know, it would be possible, Lord willing, you know, through his provision, that we could replicate, you know, Towernoff, a version of Towernoff, some, somewhere in the Rocky Mountains of North America. God presented some opportunities to grow the business very dramatically, just a you know, huge adventure of faith. And um, the outcome of that, the fruit of that, was we had resources. Started praying more specifically and got to a point where we said, you know, let's start looking. See if there is a place out there that would fit the ministry model. I went to Taunhoff and, um, and there met Carl and Brad and, and uh, we were all ski instructors there. They uh, um, kind of trained me and, and grew me up. I was, quite, I was quite rough around the edges. We were roommates together over there and just had a blast. Uh, my wife's from Calgary and she got the Rockies right near her and grew up skiing and, and I love the mountains and lived in Colorado when I was really young and so we wanted to get back to the mountains. My wife put uh, resumes in up and down the Rocky Mountains just in different, uh, different places and the only place that called um, was, uh, was Greeley, Colorado where Brad and Jane were and we only knew Greeley because of Brad and Jane. When we lived in Greeley, Brad and I used to get together uh, once a week for breakfast. Then one time he said, uh, you know, hey, Jane and I have been talking about this, but we're thinking about putting together something like, uh, like Tarnhoff. You want to be a part of it? And it's like, you know, you know, 
well, let me pray about it for the next 30 seconds. So yeah, uh, I mean, it was such an important part of our lives that we wanted to be a part of, uh, we wanted to be a part of it. And we wanted to be a part of something that touched other people's lives. The very first property that we looked at was what became ultimately Timberline Lodge. And we showed up here, parked out front, had our criteria and we rolled in and kind of looked around and within a very short period of time, 25, 30 minutes, we're certain it wasn't it. Let's move on. <laughs> we went to Jackson Hole and, you know, we had to, of course, take our skis and ski and, you know, all that kind of stuff. We went to Telluride and Summit County and, and uh, you know, different places around and Steamboat. And as far north as Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and multiple points in between, and made offers on, on properties, thought we had a couple bought. Ultimately, they didn't move forward, and almost after 18 months, almost came to the end of ourselves, if you know what I mean. I mean, it, we think it was a spiritual process, but it was almost like, okay, Lord, maybe this isn't supposed to happen. looked and looked and looked and made offers and you know here's our criteria and we'd gone back through them and refined them a bit so we went back through them and called up our broker and he pipes up and says well what you're really saying is that very first property you looked at is probably the right property and he said you want me to call him and see if it's still available I said sure why not you know nothing to lose and so he did, and it was still available, still on the market, almost two years later. About that time, you know, um, Brad was talking to Carl and we were just kind of going, okay, how do we put this thing together? And we're talking to Major Thomas and he's coming and looking at the property. And so circled back and made an offer and they accepted it. It's kind of scary. It's like, okay, now what? In June of 1995, I was seated at a closing table, writing a big check to the seller, realizing you're stepping across the threshold. It was an exciting step, but it, it was a scary step. Um, it's a step of dependency. Okay, Lord, here we go. You're gonna have to show up. Owenhof. I was a three-year-old believer at the time. I understood from Romans 5, 8, that at the right time, Christ died for me and for my sins. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? And I heard the truth of that, and it just clicked for me at that time that the Christian life wasn't just about trying to be good. And that's what I was doing for many years. I was trying to be a good Christian. And I realized I can't do that in my own power. When I was done with seminary, there really wasn't a spot for me at Tellenwolf. So I was like, okay, Lord, I still feel called to Europe. What should I do? We came back to Europe for three years with another ministry, and we were working with war refugees during the Bosnian War in Croatia. And we were thinking, okay, is this where we belong? And then Brad contacted us. And I was thinking about doing something like that here, and I'd love for you to be a part of uh, the team. I don't know, it was maybe a week or two. And then we got back together with Brad and said, yeah, we'd love to come. We're coming up over the pass, and then we start coming down into the valley and just the whole Fraser Valley, how it opens up there. It's like, wow, 
this is amazing. And we pull into the parking lot and we see the, the three lodge buildings and I could see all the possibilities. And then Greg was going to be a part of the team as well. And I just thought, wow, we've got these experiences. We've got a relationship with one another. This is going to be awesome. We had one child. Well, actually, uh, my youngest daughter, or my oldest daughter, Megan, was born, you know, as we were renovating here. Beginning a new ministry, we basically, we just kind of did everything. We even had, you know, like Greg helping in the kitchen. And so, right, that for itself was like, wow, that's pretty cool. <laughs> I did most of the maintenance and we all did other parts of the maintenance and, and, and the programs. And In our role, we were donating eggs to the ham and eggs breakfast and they were all donating the ham. And just that, yeah, sense of vertical dependency yeah. but horizontal interdependency. That was a big And theme. that commitment that happened then, had to happen, ministry would not have begun to begin without it that continues to this day and all the staff that have come and given of themselves their lives sacrificially that you all do to this day continues to humble us and crushes us really with as just a expression and a manifestation of God's abounding grace. Yeah. Both here and uh, carpenter and drywaller, right. yeah. seeker. <laughs> We had in those early days a lot before us, right? We needed to develop a mission statement, a vision, what we're doing and those kinds of things. So, you know, Greg, Brad and I spent a lot of time talking about that and what, that's, what that should look like. And then we didn't want to compete with Ravencrest. There was a good thing going on over there and yet we're a torchbearer center. And so there's going to naturally be some crossover and how can we be unique and that type of thing. And skiing, of course, was one of those things because we were so close. What we felt like God was leading us to do was to create something like Tarnhoff. That's what we knew. We, um, we started off with a Bible school-like Upward Bound at Tarnhoff, and uh, you know we called it Ascent. We looked at the classroom, though, for what we wanted to achieve here as discovering the great adventure, and to use the classroom of the outdoors and the physical pursuits and those types of things to help people recognize what it means to walk with Christ. There was the fruit of lives that were changed and I could go through a bunch of names of people that we walked life with and saw Christ begin to transform and change their lives. And so it was natural for us to want to reach out in the community. You know, we were involved in the local church it wasn't the pretty, um, rich, pretty people that were in our church. It was the, you, 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 always, you would always laugh, it was kind of the church of the dysfunctional. <laughs> so, yeah, but it was, it was beautiful. That's where Christ, that's, where, that's the people that Christ hung out with. We did a lot of outreaches with young kids because we all had young kids on staff. and. It really ministered to the families here for women to come away and not have to worry about laundry, cleaning, and feeding of the kids, and that the kids would have a program where they would hear about Jesus Christ in their lives and have the chance to accept kids Him. Didn't with, go to Sunday school. Yeah, we brought neighbors and friends that came to know Christ. We had neighbors and friends who brought their kids who came to know Christ up here. That was incredible and just overwhelming. I don't even know.
know, like as far as the name Timberline, was that something that Brad came up with? I don't even oh, know. Yeah. You know, the idea of Timberline is that we we weren't quite at Timberline right here, but the idea behind it, what was going on in the valley, is different than what's going on in the peaks. I've always been amazed by Timberline as a geographic feature. I mean, radical. The life below Timberline is different than the life above Timberline. We were up here almost every weekend with our kids coming back and forth, and we would stop at Olive Garden and they had tablecloths that you could use crayons with. We would play with the kids, drawing pictures and everything, and we started writing Timberline. The, the original graphic design that Carl and, and Brad put together was rich with color and it had the greenness of the evergreens. And for me, green is this color of life. I saw less initially of this liminal place where you're moving from one to the other as more of the need to live in a place where there's life. We're going through the forest and everything's beautiful and the flowers, so many wildflowers and the clear stream, and you say, wow, this is amazing. And then you get above where that timber line is. You step over that threshold, you're facing the elements in a much stronger way, even a summer day. And there's a great profit in learning from that change and being able to tell yourself there's gonna be struggles in life. And we can face those struggles through the power of Christ dwelling in us. spring of 2001, we met with our board, we shared a vision of, of going to the next step. And that's where this vision was born of more of a, a small discipleship model because of what we received. We received a smaller place. Uh, we didn't have the, the beds. We, we just didn't have as much, but we could use that then to create something unique. It was the 12th of September, 2001, our first day of Bible school. So those who were coming bought airline tickets and uh, we literally had people flying from Europe that were stranded in Montreal as they were coming to come to Bible school because they were flying on 9-11-2001 on the day that 9-11 took place. And no longer could we just get international students. And every year they changed the, the visa system. And, and so it was a really challenging kind of 10 year run there. But in it again, God was shaping us through the suffering to answer the deeper prayers. And that was to bring students, whoever, whoever it was that God wanted to come and, and experience something at Timberline, they made it. And I think we can look back and see God's faithfulness in answering those deeper questions in ways that we didn't anticipate it. And we saw the fruit that God was bearing through his Holy Spirit working within the lives of each student, each staff member as they came. Beth and I met in Southern California in 2001. And uh, soon after that, um, I came to faith in the Lord. I had been living a ski bum lifestyle and Beth had recently come to faith in the Lord. And the church I was attending in Vail uh, was taking a men's retreat. And literally the day that the men's retreat was happening, I, they asked me to go and I went. And uh, over at Ravencrest, the teachings of Major Thomas and Wayne Weissman and Frank Cerrone were communicated and it was the life of Christ and I was like, man, this is awesome. I want more of this. In fact, this is what I was living my entire life for. And I was living my best life, so I thought. <laughs> and uh, having the excitement, hearing the excitement of Pete coming back and talking about this thing that he'd just been to that and there's going to be this Bible school in Fraser, Colorado and we had, I had no idea. but his growing excitement and then talking through the, with the staff, Rob and Ryan, and getting started in the, in the Bible school, I just said, I want to be there. I don't want to hear about it. I want to experience it. And um, not knowing a thing about what we were getting into. You know, we didn't do a taste and see. We didn't come and... Um, <laughs> I had no idea had that no our roommates what, would be 18. We were 32 <laughs> and 34. I was 35 at the five, time. Yeah. And Shortly after, they asked us to come back and help out for the second year Bible school to volunteer. And we said, sure, we'll do that. We have no <laughs> idea what that looks like. So we stumbled and bumbled our way through that and uh, really saw um, the Lord working through students, um, 
Zane Black was in that year and uh, 30 something other students. I didn't know Jesus uh, growing up in a non-Christian home. I was selling drugs for a living and a friend's family shared Christ with me. And that was really my transition from death to life and then coming to Timberline, it was like I found out that what the fullness of life was. You know, it was funny because I, I feel like I came for fun, just snowboarding and good times and a little bit of Jesus on the side. And it was like that first year at Timberline, I began to experience the fullness of life, fullness of life in Christ, the life that I longed for and all and looked for and all these other things. Every year, students arrive and inevitably we, we get to know them very, you know, surface and we say, oh, this is going to be the best year ever. <laughs> and then staff and students both find out like, okay, the reality of life and living together in community and um, the struggles of, um, you know, the stuff that people are going through that they bring with them to Timberline and we all dive into it together and then by the time graduation comes, of course, between the tears, there's the parents who pick their kids up and say, that's not the same kid. <laughs> so, that's the paycheck. I think about our, our hikes up Mount Ida. Uh, that was something Phil Peterson had the idea of, so uh, kudos to Phil Peterson, who's on staff for a few years as a program director. First of all, every person had to be prepared. Every person, to the ability that they had, needed to have their own jackets on, their own hiking shoes. They had to have some inner work that allowed them to enter into the community. We then took the vans at midnight and drove up to Mount Ida. There's always a headwind when you do Mount Ida. There's just like this, if you do it enough, it's really annoying headwind, and it's tiring. I think uh, that had to have been my worst experience at Timberline. Uh, I think that's like the threshold of death. <laughs> Two o'clock in the morning or something? I feel like that's sometimes when I would go to bed, and here we are gonna hike up. I didn't even like hiking. And it's just blowing, and it's and it's exhausting. But there is that ascent to the, to the summit. And when you get up there, you look around, it's like, this was worth it. You cross over that threshold of tree line, all of a sudden you're exposed, but you get a whole new perspective. On that morning, the community would take and, and help the entire group cross that threshold to go through Timberline, to hike on up through the tundra, and at 4.48 a.m., as the sun crested over Long's Peak, there we are standing there aware that the light of God, the life of God is, is continually coming and coming. So the imagery of, the, of Timberline is, is made on that very first week. The best highlight of the year, often it's the Moab trip. And that is where they are. They're pushed. They're sleeping outside five nights in a row and it's cold. And, and they get to do two big repels. And you see students who are hesitant and like, really? I can? Like, yes, you're good. This rope will hold a Volkswagen. And yet they have to trust that. And it's cool because we have staff members and fellow students that are there like, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. It'll hold you. But they have to make this decision, like, okay, is it, am, am I going to lean into this? And uh, I think that's a lot what we experience with students who come here, who realize after they're getting exposed to the Word, they're like, I don't think I actually have a relationship with the Lord. I don't think I've ever leaned and put my trust into Him. In fact, I was just having a conversation with a girl two days ago who said, it wasn't until second semester that I put my faith in the Lord. I think, you know, we live these thermostatically controlled lives and you get frustrated that you can't set the temperature to the 10th degree on the car, you know, what do you mean? 70, not 69.9. And I think that translated, translates into our Christian lives. So I think something that can uniquely happen at Bible school, a lot of students that come here have never been uncomfortable grab their hands and jump off the cliff with them.
And I think a great way to do that is outreach, to take students on evangelistic outreach. You know, I've seen so many students just take steps of faith and talk with people that the Lord is leading them to and have these great conversations and some leading people to the Lord. And it is super exciting when that happens. Just over the years, there's kind of become this um, understanding that we will be in the community. That's, um, that's imperative. And uh, between Soup and Tune and Mountain Ministry, now we're able to, we're finding opportunities right here in our community to serve. And something has changed, something has shifted from, um, we can get everything we need just from these people around us, to no, we, we have the light, let's take it into this community around us. Our hope and prayer is that all of our students, staff, guests, have such an amazing encounter with Christ when they come to Timberline that they go out as church bears and change the world. That's the only hope the world has. The gospel is the power of God and the salvation. It saves individuals, saves marriages, saves families, saves my, my life my parents' marriage, our family. I would say over the last 14 years, the biggest challenge has been some of the physical factors um, that we have at Timberline, the housing, old buildings, uh, wrestling with just a place that wasn't designed initially for what we're doing and what the Lord's brought it to. Some of the, some of the sweetest times have been times of real challenge but where we came together and I think lived out and experienced the unity that comes in Christ in the midst of challenge and hardship. And as much as I wouldn't have thought those would be highlights when we were going through them, looking back, those are sweet times. Those are the times I remember. And then over this last year, it's been just incredible to see the Lord begin to provide for what seems to be the future of the ministry. Uh, as we launched into the Growth Rings campaign and looked towards this property next door, this 85 acres that is seemingly the base of what the Lord is going to do next through the ministry of Timberline. As I think about the next 25 years uh, of Timberline, I don't see us changing much. I mean, the message is the same, the heart of the ministry is the same, and, uh, and I hope that never changes. I think what we are seeing the Lord leading us towards is expanding what He's been doing for the last 25 years to continue to invite people up to the beauty of the mountains, uh, to experience the person of Jesus, to, to be in the Word, studying the Word, and out in nature, seeing His, his character, uh, and, and to provide a space that makes that possible. As I reflect on the, the name of the ministry, I think everything has meaning. So even the fact that Brad and Jane and, and those who first started it chose the name Timberline, I think is gonna mark Timberline for its entire life. We've been taking guests and students up into Timberline, above Timberline, for years. It's one of those things I think when you're in the mountains you do. And yet as I was thinking about the idea of Timberline, there's this reality that we're called to grow in him, to understand who he is, to live in his life, but not to stay down into those safe places, those places where there's life all around us, but to actually venture up into the places where there's death. Even when you think about the Timberline and going above the Timberline into almost like the tundra, where it's a little bit more harsh environment, it's the same exact picture of leaving Timberline, Timberline Lodge after a year of Bible school. You're really transitioning out into what can very 
often be a much harsher environment. I think Timberline is going to continue to be a threshold of life where people come to experience life and life to the fullest in Christ. But we can't keep that to ourselves. There is a world that longs to know the life that we have in Christ. And I think Timberline's uniquely set up to be like a springboard that launches people into life to, to be ambassadors of Christ's life to a dying world. That's always been a part of, of the heart. It's actually been a part of the heart of Torchbearers ever since the beginning. And of course, the heart of the Lord Jesus to, to come into this world where there's death so that he could bring life. It's amazing what God does. You can't contain his spirit and the burden he has for the lost and just to be living sacrifices, offer ourselves up to him individually, corporately, offer the place of Timberline up to him to use for his purposes to bring people across that threshold of life.